Four years ago, Royal Caribbean, best known for huge good value resort ships, surprised so many people by buying Silver Sea, known for ultra luxury small ship cruising, so almost the opposite. Having cruised on it before Takeover, I decided I should return to Silver Sea to see if the online reviews from other pre Takeover cruisers saying things like, not the same Silver Sea, and before it was sold, we thought Silver Sea was superb, well run with delicious food, but not now. I want to see if they were right or not. So I booked myself on Silver Spirit for a two week cruise, and this is what I found. By the way, if you're new here, welcome aboard. I'm Gary Bembridge, helping you to get cruising right, including if Silver Sea is still worth considering. But before I get into what I found to be good, bad, and the same, I thought it's worth reminding you what Silver Sea is or was. Founded by the Lefebvre family as an ultra luxury, all inclusive cruise line, it competes with Region 7 Seas, Seaborne, Crystal, and the new Explorer Journeys. It has the biggest fleet of all the ultra luxury lines, 12, making it almost double the next largest. Now, unlike most of those, it has a classic and an expedition fleet and calls on 900 ports a year, which is double the next biggest competitor, Seaborne. You'll pay around $1,300 a night per person in a classic veranda suite. That's about the same price as Regent and Crystal and a little bit more than if you're going on Seaborne. So what did I find they're doing the same, better and worse under the new ownership, starting with what hasn't really changed? Well, there's still an ultra luxury line with both classic and expedition ships, and much of the senior management, surprisingly from before, is actually still around. One of the things that is the same, but also changed, is the all-inclusive offer, as they've got more inclusions now because they've got the door-to-door -door and port-to-port -port fares, so two different types of fares. The door-to-door -door fare moved them closer to what Regent do. This fare includes a limo transfer from your home to the airport, usually business class flights, a pre-cruise hotel stay, transfers from the hotel to the ship, all the onboard inclusions, butler drinks, basic Wi-Fi, gratuities, most speciality dining, and now also a choice of one excursion per port. Then also you get a post-hotel stay or a day room if needed, transfer to the airport, and then a limo home. The port to port is a cruise only fare with just those same inclusions on board. Talking of fares, they still offer many, many cruises with low solar supplements of around 20% to 25%, which really appeals to me. They still have butlers for every single suite grade, not just the highest grades, still making them different to all the competition. It still has, in my view, the strictest and most complied to dress code across the ultra luxury lines. This is the only one that I ever feel and still do feel the need to get dressed up more on. They have three dress codes, casual, where I could wear a collared shirt and slacks, informal, where I was expected to wear a jacket with tie optional, and then formal with tuxedo or dark suit and tie. One of the things that is still the same is the style of service, and this still divides cruises as it did before. Silver Sea has a more formal, even slightly aloof, and I guess more European style of service compared to the more sort of relaxed, chatty, perhaps more American style of the other lines. While overall good service, there are a couple of issues I feel post takeover that I will come to later. In terms of entertainment, I found on my cruise that it's largely unchanged from before. In my view, unfortunately, it's still stuck a little bit in the past and very classic cruise fare. To be honest, I did find it a little disappointing that it was still the same, since Royal Caribbean have enormous expertise in entertainment. While some people tell me that on the newer ships they definitely felt that it's improved, I did find the daily program was basically much the same. Trivia, bingo, table tennis competitions, cooking demonstrations, live music and lounges, and the production shows. Now these are the standard themed song and dance with, for me, I'm sorry, data themes and music. I'm in my mid-60s and it still feels like it's more my parents' generation that the entertainment's talking to. They did have an enrichment program that still stood out versus the competition. On my trip, they had four speakers, one on destination and ports, one on local South African politics and history, one on wildlife and game parks, and then, slightly stranger for the region, although interesting, uh, one about Lindy Chamberlain, the dingo baby case in Australia. I've left dining and food for the last in the what's of the same category because it overlaps with the improved and worst areas at the same time that I will cover next. In the past, I found the food on silver to be good. And unlike reviews and some people on my trip, I feel that they still do really good food. 
Some people told me they felt the grades of meats and the produce was perhaps worse because maybe they've shifted to use Royal Caribbean's providers or there's been budget cuts. Personally, I didn't think that at all. However, there are a couple of things around that whole area that probably drove and qualify why I thought that perhaps versus other people. One thing I do feel is different but cannot check as I didn't keep them from before is I felt the items and choice on the menus were smaller than they used to be, even though it's still a good range and a choice. Even if they're not smaller than before, they're definitely smaller than I had on competition, say like Regent. All ships do not have, though it's important to understand, the same dining venues. But what I do like that as before, Silver Sea have many dining venues and more than on many of the competitive lines in ultra luxury. Let me talk about included dining first. On Silver Spirit, I had Atlantide, which is the closest you come to a traditional dining room in menu and style. It was open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Then I had Indochine, an Asian focused restaurant, which operated more as a main dining room at night. I didn't have to make reservations in the evening, by the way, for either of those two restaurants. I then had La Terrazza, which is the buffet for breakfast and lunch. In the evening, it turns into an Italian restaurant, which does require reservation. In there in the evening, they do great Italian food. The buffet was, and still is relatively small, but it was definitely generous enough with a pasta station, good desserts at lunch, that kind of thing. The Silver Sea Signature Grill is still there. This pool deck grill has an informal lunch menu, you know, things like hamburgers and so on. But for dinner, it turns into their signature hot rocks, the piping hot lava stones, where you get to cook your own food. I always enjoy that. They then have uh, Spacanapoli, the outdoor pizza restaurant, over most of the day and into the evening. Many say it has the best pizza at sea. I'm not sure that's true, uh, that it ever was, but it still is very good. I could, but I didn't need to make reservations there. They also have Silver Note, which is a venue which plays jazz music in the evening, and a venue I loved called Arts Cafe, which is a relatively new addition, but it did come in pre-takeover. This is their coffee shop. It has snacks all day and into the evenings, a, a big favorite of mine. Then, of course, I also had room service. Now, I loved that in the evening I had lots of variety included in my fare, but they also then have some specialty dining with fees, which I do find strange for an ultra-luxury high line fare, though it was the case before the takeover too. Like all ships, there was the fancy La Dame, which is a Silver Sea signature, which you pay $60 for per person if you don't do the wine pairing. They also had uh, Seishin, which is open some days for lunch, but always for dinner. This is kind of an Asian Japanese restaurant, and this was $40 per person to dine there. I really, really like this one. But what I did like too, which is true of Silver Sea before, is unlike some competition, I was, wasn't limited to how often I could go to any of the restaurants. And I went to all of them a couple of times, which leads me on to what I think Silver Sea is doing better before some of the things that I find that they're actually doing worse since takeover. The first what's better is in dining. They launched the SALT program in 2021, which stands for Sea and Land Taste. And the concept is to make the food and drink on board way more connected to the destination, which even on other ultra luxury lines is not really done in much depth. It includes dining experiences with local menus, with a SALT kitchen restaurant and bar on the newer ships, uh, along with uh, local food and wine excursions, there's salt cooking classes and salt cooking demonstrations. Less good is it's not on all ships like it wasn't on Silver Spirit. The closest I got on my cruise was a South African chef doing a cooking demonstration of three classic South African dishes along with the history behind them, which was really interesting. The other thing I found that they're doing better is around the area of excursions. Now, first of all, Everyone gets access to excursions when booking. So they're rewarding those of us like me who book early. You know, so for example, on that South African trip, I had booked way in advance. And as soon as I did, I could access and book and I got all the excursions that I wanted. It wasn't based on what grade you've booked. Secondly, which I love, instead of meeting in, the, in a venue and being allocated a sticker and waiting, I could just head out when I was ready to go on my excursion at the time. Someone at the end of the gangway then allocates me to a bus. It just feels so much more kind of sophisticated. Third, though not everyone, to be honest, agreed with me, I felt actually that the included excursions were really good and weren't just basic walking or panoramic bus tours. So I went on some pretty incredible excursions to game parks, catamarans to view seals, a four by four ride over these massive dunes in Namibia. 
I didn't actually feel the need to book the premium excursions as I do on other lines with included tours. So far so good, but what did I find they're not doing as well as before? First, I think for me, the biggest change that I saw is it did feel more corporate. It did feel less kind of family owned. And it's one of the things that's hard to put your finger on exactly, which is why I think many people in reviews said there was kind of something off, but they couldn't quite kind of work out what it was. Of course, it may be because the fleet has grown dramatically since takeover, with five new ships entering service at the time of recording. Silver Moon, Silver Dawn, Silver Nova, Silver Origin, and Silver Endeavor, and more on the way. It is a much bigger operation, so it's likely, I guess, that the pre-takeover kind of Silver Sea crew are dispersed, they're diluted across the fleet, and of course, there's lots of new crew post-shutdown. Also, versus what I remember, the visibility of senior crew was pretty low, and even when they're about, I didn't think there was a lot of interaction and engagement with passengers. It felt pretty limited. So other than the daily updates or the welcome captain's party, you didn't really see the senior team kind of active engaging with passengers. That felt very different to what I remember from before. I also found, and this is nitpicking a bit, communication and attention to detail felt a little bit mixed and not as slick as it was before. A really simple example. On embarkation day for the mustard drill, the television was telling us one thing, the announcements another thing, the daily program said something else, and we were told something else when we checked in. So there was kind of just that sort of attention to detail and consistency that you kind of expect when you're paying that kind of fare. Another example of communication was we had choppy weather and they dropped a tender port call at Mossel Bay. It wasn't particularly well communicated, it was just announced. Uh, then there wasn't any senior crew about and willing to take questions on it, which lots of people had, because they knew another ship had gone in and was tendering. Another thing I felt was less good was a shift from crew giving a really personalized proactive service to a little bit more of a ask and you will receive approach, which if you did ask, you did get. But let me give some examples. You know, there's a lot a butler can do and bring, but if you don't know what it is, then you miss out because it's not explained or wasn't done proactively about what they could do. You know, things like getting canapes every day or special treats or the ability to have afternoon tea served in your room. I kind of, I realized that I needed to brush up on what I could get before I went to be able to ask. It wasn't kind of proactive and interactive. I also discovered after the trip that it could have had caviar on demand, but unless I, I, I knew that, I didn't ask for it and it wasn't really apparent. So kind of an ask and you will receive. In the rest Restaurant, I would go most mornings to Atlantide for breakfast, and over the course of two weeks, so quite a lot, I basically had this pretty much the same way to but they just didn't remember things like I had decaf coffee with skim milk. You know, other ultra luxury lines I've been on, I found that staff are trained and encouraged to remember and offer kind of really personalized service. And I found when I go, you know, my decaf skim milk, it basically arrives without me asking. So they're just that attention to detail personalization. Now I know these are small and picky issues, but as an ultra luxury line and for the fair, and since so other lines do it, I also remember it being the case before. So this, I feel, seems to have changed. But overall, I felt the service was good. It just wasn't perhaps as sharp and proactive as before. I felt on balance that reviewers are being, in my view, too harsh in thinking that Silver Sea is being dumbed down or ruined by Royal Caribbean ownership. It's grown fast because of their resources. And I came away thinking, you know, these are perhaps some growing pains. They're making some edges a little bit less sharp, but not so bad that they're ruining it. I think they're fixable and, and I think they will elevate. And I will go again based on what I experienced on Silver Sea. But if you feel that Silver Sea is not for you, find out what I think of Region 7 Sea Cruises, one of the closest lines to them, by joining me in this video, where I start with one thing people get wrong about them and why. See you over there.